Our next speaker is Professor Mark Gordon from Iowa State University, and the title is Transitioning Legacy Code for the Exascale Era. Morning, everybody. Uh, Daniel, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, we've been spending quite a bit of time in the last three years or so developing Exascale uh, software capability, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, just so, in, just in case not everybody understands or knows what exascale computing is, uh, as you know, everybody knows that uh, the capability of a computer is expressed in terms of flops, floating point operations per second. So, mega flops are ten to whoops, ten to the six uh, flops. Uh, Giga flops are a, a billion. Teraflops a trillion. And just put that in perspective, the US budget is a 3.5 trillion, so you could call, you could call that 3.5 terabucks. Uh, petaflop computing is a million billion or 10 to the 15 flops, and that's where we are right now. So most computers, uh, state of the art in the top 500 computers are some number of petaflops. Um, and so I, I include the name Summit here, which I'll, I'll repeat on the next slide which is the number one computer in the United States right now. It's Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So an exaflop is a billion billion or 10 to the 18th flops floating point operations per second. There are no exaflop computers at the moment. Uh, the lead in, in the United States for exa exascale computing is, a, is the US Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, we are all working very hard to make this happen, exascale computing happen in the US within the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, there are two computers, uh, two computer systems that are in progress. One is called Aurora. Uh, it's Argonne National Laboratory and the other is Frontier at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And all these computers in the US and most of them around the world are, are heterogeneous architectures, which means that you have combined uh, traditional CPUs with uh, some other kind of computing and the most prominent other kind of computing accelerators are the GPUs, graphical processing units, and so, for example, the most the current top 500 computers in the world, uh, number one is Fugaku in Japan, uh, which is a combination of CPU and ARM. Uh, many less people probably are familiar with ARM than GPUs. ARM doesn't stand for anything. It comes from a company originated in the, in the UK called ARM. Uh, and it currently is, has the capability of 415 fed up flops. Summit was number one until it was displaced, displaced by Fugaku. Uh, and that is at Oak Ridge, as I mentioned. It is a combination of IBM Power 9 CPUs and NVIDIA V100 GPUs with 148 petaflops. And number three is Sierra, which is at uh, Livermore uh, in the US, uh, IBM CPU plus NVIDIA GPUs. Um, they're all heterogeneous computers, com combination of CPUs and some kind of accelerator arm or, uh, or GPUs. Um, and in fact, the, the vast majority of the top 500 are now heterogeneous computers. And so this, this is a real challenge because you, you now, you can't write code anymore. At least you can't write highly performant code that relies just on one type of uh, computing architecture. You need to have multiple, at least two. All right, so let me, again, this is something that most of you are familiar with. I'm just gonna put this, just to put my talk in perspective. Uh, the scalability of different of the most popular types of um, quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry methods um, are Hartree-Fock and DFT, which scale on the order into the fourth, MP2, which scales on the order into, into the fifth, uh, CCSD parentheses T and related methods scale on the order into the seventh. So for a couple cluster, you double the size of the system and you multiply the, the computer needs by a factor of 128. And that's very limiting. Uh, so the solutions that I'm going to talk about today, there are lots of solutions, but the three that we'll talk about today are fragmentation methods, uh, highly parallel code, and the use of uh, density fitting or resolution of the identity. And uh, these, are, these are not exclusive, of course, you, you, you use all these together. So let me talk about the frontier molecular orbital method, which was actually started quite a long time ago by Kaz Kitaura in Japan. And uh, a major contributor to this is Dmitry Fedorov, uh, at, also in Japan. And the idea is, uh, is not a unique idea, but it basically is to divide a large molecular system to smaller fragments. And then you, use, you do this by using a many body expansion. And so FMO accounts for the influence of the entire system during each 
um, individual fragment calculation. It's inherently parallel because you can put each fragment on a different node or, and you can define a fragment however you like. And as a consequence of this, and I will show you examples, you can do tens of thousands of atoms uh, with ab initio quantum mechanics, which is quite astounding. In games, this is implemented for all these, basically any method in games, uh, ranging from Hartree-Fock to couple cluster theory. Uh, we have fully analytic gradients for Hartree-Fock, MP2 and DFT, and fully analytic Hessians for Hartree-Fock and DFT. And we can do molecular dynamics with periodic or spherical boundary conditions. And since, um, since the, our, our, our leader in this conference is Cho Ho Choi, I will give him a shout out because he's the one who puts spherical boundary conditions into games. So the, it's a very simple idea. You, you have some interesting chemical system and you, you identify uh, functional groups and you can make each functional group a fragment. In this case, it's propanol. And you have <clears throat> one fragment methyl group and then two methylene groups and an hydroxy group. If you have molecular clusters like water, it's even easier. You don't, have to, you don't have to cut across covalent bonds at all. You just can define each water as a fragment. Or if there's some reason to do it, you can define each fragment to be four waters or, or eight waters or 16 waters. Um, so the basic idea is a, is a many body expansion. So you can expand, write the energy of the sum of the energies of fragments. That ignores fragment-fragment uh, interaction. So just stopping at this point is not very good. And so typically uh, what one would do is add all explicitly all fragment-fragment um, or dimer interactions. And if I stop at this point, the first line that's called FMO2, and I can add in trimers. Uh, trimers, explicit trimers are gonna be very important if you have uh, um, extensive hydrogen bonding networks like you do in water. Um, and so that would be called FMO3. And you can keep going like this. Of course, the higher order in the expansion you go, the more expensive the calculation becomes. Um, the nice thing about um, the way we do uh, fragmentation is we have something developed by initially by Graham Fletcher and later by uh, Ryan Olson and Alastair Rendell um, called the Generalized Dis Distributed Data Interface. And that allows you to do massively parallel um, um, uh, calculations. And the diagram here kind of explains this. So you can put each fragment or pair of fragments, however you like to do it, on each node. So each node here is called a group because you could have, a group, in, in principle, you could have a group of nodes. And so that's embarrassingly parallel. It's called coarse grained parallelism. Um, and if you've written the code, Hartree Fock or MP2 or a couple cluster, in a highly parallel manner, then you can have fine grained parallelism within each node across the CPUs or GPUs. And so um, that allows you to, to do very large systems. So one example of this is water clusters, which is kind of our favorite test case. Um, and so uh, this is a, a picture of uh, clusters of water from 512 up to 4,000. Uh, 4,000 is actually small compared to what we've done now. And I will show you that in later slides. Uh, so if you do these, uh, these water clusters with FMO2, uh, and then you can, you can get almost perfect scaling and linear scaling uh, all the way up to a quarter of a million uh, cores. So that's, you can think of that in a, in a qualitative sense as a quarter of the way from petascale to, to exascale. And for FMO3, same, same story. So these, these uh, curves are highly, uh, highly parallel, almost perfectly parallel. And um, they're also linear scaling. And the reason, the way that the linear scaling was accomplished is to, to remove all IO except for the initial input and the final output of data. Uh, so this paper was, was is now about four years old, written in, uh, published in J, JCTC in 2016. So one of our targets um, this is um, uh, to study heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, and that's done using something uh, called the mesoporosilicon nanoparticles. And the person who synthesizes these is on the right here, Igor Slowing. And Jim Evans is one of my colleagues at Iowa State. He does non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And so we have a, a kind of a three-way uh, collaboration between uh, Jim and Igor and myself. And I should, I should also mention Teresa Windus uh, to study the phenomena that happen in these, in these MSNs or mesoporosilicon nanoparticles. Um, and here's a schematic of the idea. So uh, on the edges of these, um, of these MSNs, you have what are called gatekeeper groups. These are these guys in red. 
Um, and their job is to only allow in the, mole the molecules that you want in there, which in, in this schematic are the Bs, are the, sorry, are the As, you don't want the Bs in. So these guys, these uh, gatekeeper groups keep the As from going in. And once they're inside, they react. The, these um, blue guys here hanging at the top or the bottom are uh, the catalyst groups. Typically they're polynitrogen, poly polyomines, but they, they, there are a variety of, of catalysts. They're very highly specific catalysts. And so once you have the reaction occur, uh, then you get product and the, the getting the product out is entirely diffusion controlled. And so one of the parts of the collaboration with Jim, and, Jim Evans and I uh, are to study the diffusion of various um, molecules, whatever's inside there, including solvent. I guess I should mention that this that solvent is inside these, these guys as well. Um, and so you end up with tens of thousands of atoms. And, and that, so that's a challenge to, to uh, address with, with ab initio quantum chemistry. Uh, so here's a, a picture of uh, a piece of an M MSN. This has got 1,738 atoms. Each color is a different fragment. And so there are 20 some fragments uh, split into, uh, into groups of atoms on the order of, of 300 atoms per each, although e each fragment is different. So th it's kind of heterogeneous. And so this is the baseline. This is our baseline system which we, with which we study the catalysis. And uh, this young woman on the right here is, uh, was, was a visiting uh, graduate student with us from Brazil. She's now back in Brazil. Um, and so she set up a, um, a kind of a, a model problem in which the, the MSN is represented by simple silanol, which is, you kind of would guess wouldn't be perfect. Uh, and then the polyamine is the catalyst group and, the, and this is the uh, acetone. And so we, we looked at three different mechanisms. One mechanism in which the silanol was just an observer, just sitting around watching. The second one is which, in which the silanol was hydrogen bonding to the system. And the third one in which the silanol actually participates as, as part of the reaction system. And you might guess that TS3 is the one that would be the most uh, the lowest energy barrier, and that of course is right. However, it's interesting that if you do the, oh, I guess I should say that in addition to this toy problem, we also did this 1738 system, uh, this, that system uh, using FMO. Um, and so we wanted to find out if the toy problem could capture the actual mechanism. And unfortunately, the, they both, both of them favor this um, uh, TS3 as you might guess, but the small model phase favors a concerted mechanism. But if you put in the rest of the sil of the MSN, put in the rest of the sil siloxy groups, um, that gives you more hydrogen bonding and it prefers, uh, uh, pretty strongly prefers a stepwise mechanism. And so the problem here is that if you only use a small model, you don't really capture the true chemistry and you really have to use the big system. And that means that you really need to use something like fragmentation methods to study these more, more realistic systems. All right, the second fragmentation method I wanna tell you about is uh, the effective fragment potential method or EFP. Um, and it is con constructed from Coulomb polarization, exchange repulsion, dispersion, and charge transfer components. Uh, they're all done by distributed uh, expansions of some sort, all based on localized orbitals. Uh, the, the polarizability is very important because it's iterated to self-consistency, and that means it captures many body effects, which can be very, very important. And uh, this whole EFP architecture is um, constructed from first principles, all derived from first principles. There's absolutely no fitted parameters whatsoever. So that means if you decide tomorrow, I want to do a, an EFP calculation on some molecule that's never been tried before, you can do that just by using something called the make EFP run. Um, so let me show you how EFP works. Um, this is uh, done by Tony Smith. Um, and so we're, we're looking at the DNA basis and comparing with very accurate couple cluster calculations by Pavel Hopsa and his group. Um, and so here's, uh, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you in, in this slide are the hydrogen bonded structures. So these are the interactions between guanine cytosine on the left and adenine thymine on the right. Uh, and these are structures from a couple cluster calculations of Pablo Hopsa. Um, so this is a couple cluster extended to the uh, complete basis at limit uh, on the left. And that's the, that interaction energy is 32 kcal per mole and EFP gets 32 kcal per mole. Not always that good. 
And on the right is uh, adenine thymine, hydrogen bonded system. And uh, the couple cluster result is 16 or 17 kcal small, and we get about 16. So it's about a kcal per mole off. And you can see the decomposition of the energy here. Uh, it's primarily electrostatic with a little bit of polarization, a little bit of dispersion. Um, now let's go to the, to the uh, pi stacking systems. Same systems except, except now pi stacking. And the couple cluster uh, results on the left is uh, minus 19 kcal per mole and uh, EFP predicts 19 kcal per mole. And adding thymine uh, on the right, again, uh, pi stacked uh, gets uh, the couple cluster result is, is 12 kcal per mole and EFP is about 10. So that's about as bad as it gets. So it, the, the error is usually between uh, one and two k cal per mole. Uh, some time ago, David Sherrill and Ludas Lipchenko did a study of, couple, of, of EFP compared with couple cluster and comparing with lots of other uh, force fields. And it turns out that uh, their conclusion is, is that um, EFP is roughly comparable to MP2 in accuracy of intermolecular interaction. So EFP is really very, very good um, and, and much faster than, than uh, even semi-empirical quantum chemistry. Uh, you can see that on this slide. So um, if you just look at the, eight, the, the adenine thymine base pair, uh, EFP took about four seconds and MP2 took 5,471 5, seconds to get, a, a, to get a, as good a, a result. All right, so the last fragmentation method I'll talk about is, is EFMO, effective fragment molecular orbital method, which is a, basically a merger of EFP and FMO with some significant differences. Uh, but it, this, it's based on the FMO fragmentation scheme. It takes advantage of the FMO many body ex expansion um, and it uses EFP. So the, the, basically the idea of this is if the two fragments are far enough apart, their interaction is calculated with EFP. And if they're too close, then, uh, then the interaction is calculated by, what, by whatever quantum mechanics method you chose, whether it's Hartree-Fock or MP2 or couple cluster. Um, and, uh, the, the cutoff, which is called R cut, uh, that is implicit in, uh, there's a default in, in games, but uh, you, that can be overridden. Um, and so the, one of the most important comp aspects of EFMO is that um, it uses the EFP polarization or induction term, uh, which mem remember is uh, iterated to self-consistency. And so the many body terms, the many body interactions are provided by EFP. And so you don't need to go to third order as you, as you would have to do with, with, with FMO. Just to give you an example of, of <clears throat> excuse me, how, how that works. Um, this is using R cut of 0.6. And R cut of 0.6 in this particular uh, system of 32 waters uh, means that all the dimers, all the fragment fragment interactions are done with EFP. So there's no ab initio dimers. This is, this is a huge cost savings. Uh, and so the blue curve is FMO2. Uh, the red curve is EFMO and the, and the, the green, greenish curve is MP2. And you can see that EFMO falls right on the, on the line of the relative energies of these, uh, these uh, isomers of 32 waters. So the EFMO does very, very well. It's very accurate. Um, timings, uh, these are wall times comparing MP2, FMO3, FMO2, and EFMO. Uh, and I need to point out here that the MP2 and FMO3 calculations were all done using 48 CPU cores. So these numbers should really be weighted by 48. FMO2 was done using 16 CPU cores. So that, that number needs to be weighted by, six point, by 16. And EFMO was done with one core. So not only is EFMO very accurate, it's also uh, very fast compared to these other methods. All right, well, let me turn now to, um, to the RI. This is something that probably most of you know about, but just to remind you, uh, major bottleneck in what we, what we all do in uh, ab initio electronic structure theory is calculating an, all of these uh, two electron integrals and then transforming them uh, to the molecular basis to do correlated calculations. And the RI approximation simply uh, reduces these four, four center, four electron integral, two electron integrals to three center. And that uh, saves a great deal of computational effort and especially a great deal of memory. So let me show you some examples now of what we're doing. Uh, this is a, these are EFMO RI MP2 calculations. Uh, and uh, so back in 2019, last year, uh, 
we did calculations on 1,738 atoms. This is this cluster I showed you earlier. Um, we did EFMO, RIMP2, energy, and gradient, and scaled up the 32 CPU nodes on a, on a computer called Cori at, at Berkeley, at NERSC. In 2020, we added 6,000 solvent atoms and uh, did the same sorts of calculations up to 320 nodes. And I'm going to show you scaling in the next slide. Um, uh, I, I guess I skipped that. Okay. So what we've just accomplished in the last month or so, uh, thanks to Depay and Data, a postdoc in my group, um, is we now have a parallel uh, couple cluster methods for CPUs using RI, using the RI approximation. Um, and you can see on the, on the, um, the, in the graph on the lower right side that it's uh, essentially the triples part, the parentheses T, is essentially perfectly scaling. Uh, CCSD tails off a bit. And that's pretty well known. It's very, uh, it's much more challenging to, to get truly linear scaling CCSD than uh, the triples are much, much easier to do. Um, and uh, another way of seeing this is, this is look at the wall time. So uh, the wall time of the, um, the, the RI CCSD parentheses T is the green curve here. Sorry, the, 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 the pink curve here and, and the, the triples stand, uh, fit right on top of that. So the triples are perfectly scaling, uh, perfect, uh, very nice speed up. And the CCSD gets speed ups, but not wonderful speed ups. Um, fortunately, we have colleagues at the University of Tennessee who have a very clever way to make the, the CCSD part much faster. And so that's in progress now. Uh, that's using something called data-driven algorithms. And uh, you might wonder how good is the RI approximation? Uh, and it turns out it's very good. So this is a set of um, uh, 22 uh, molecules uh, set up by Stefan Grimma uh, using this basis set, uh, the CCP, PBDZ basis set, and then the, the RI, the auxiliary basis set for the RI. And the mean absolute error is about 0.02 k cos mole. The deviation, standard deviation is 0.03 k cos mole. So that's really very good. Um, so let me come back to this to give, another, give you another sense of how how good our I approximations are if you need to be convinced. Come, come back to this uh, reaction network I told you about earlier. Um, and I'm just looking now only at this model problem uh, and uh, specifically at TS3. And what you find is that um, the barrier height uh, and the net reaction energy, if you compare RI with the full, the full calculation is essentially spot on. So RI MP2 compared with MP2, uh, net energy, net reaction energy and barrier height, there's essentially no difference. If you compare RI CCSD parentheses T with CCSD parentheses T, uh, again, one a tenth of a kcal difference in the barrier height and no difference in the reaction energy. And so we're very pleased with this and we're actually moving on now to develop RI for Pyotr Pietzik's um, CRCC23 method, which we're very excited about because that allows you to break single bonds with coupled cluster theory. All right, so here's uh, some scaling that I promised to show you. Um, so this is uh, uh, EFMO on the CPU with RIMP2 on the GPU, uh, 1,738 atom MSN plus 2,000 water molecules in the solvent bath. The MSN is split into 32 fragments. The solvent is split into 250 fragments. And you can see the speed up, the, the, the ideal speed up is the reddish pink line. And our actual speed up by the blue dots, and you can see it's almost perfect, uh, up to 348 nodes. Uh, each node is 64 cores, so this is a pretty hefty calculation. Uh, this is a calculation that was done on Summit. This is, this is, um, these calculations are about two months old. And they're calculations on 20,000 water molecules split into 240 fragments. So 20,000 water molecules, we're pretty sure, um, is the largest uh, Hachi Fock calculation done with a, a second order many body expansion. Um, and so that this, um, this is pretty spectacular. Um, and you can see that as we scale uh, up the number of nodes, uh, we are almost perfect, almost perfectly along the ideal line. Um, the, the, uh, the CPU utilization, um, uh, CPU plus, plus GPU utilization uh, has 91.3% uh, parallel efficiency uh, up to four, almost, almost 4,400, <coughs> excuse me, nodes. And um, uh, that also involves 26,000 
268 NVIDIA V100 GPU. So this is using uh, almost all of Summit, uh, which is the number two, number two computer in the world right now. So we're very proud of these, of these calculations. This is with Hachi Fock. So I should note that, that uh, what we're working on now is ex extending this to RIMP2 and also um, uh, to our, eventually to RI couple cluster. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a, the last uh, slide. And uh, this is just showing you a series of calculations with two different basis sets, STO3G and 631G, uh, compared speed ups compared to games. This is games, speed up to, relative to games with 21 cores um, and one core. You can see that the speed ups relative to one core games is, is on the order of anywhere from 600 to 1500 uh, uh, speed ups. And there's a, there's a GPU code that comes out of Michigan State um, and it's called Quick. And you can see that our relative uh, uh, speed ups are the, the, the worst is about 2.4 2 and the best is around 25. So we can claim that our new code is quicker than quick. And uh, this is uh, you, games using uh, OpenMP threaded code and quick is executing on one V100 GPU. So we're, we're really pleased about this. This is brand new Hachi Fock. Um, I, did, I didn't put this on the slide, but it's something that we call the generalized Fock build because we constructed this in such a way that any kind of calculation that requires a Fock build can use the same code, whether it's CI, open shell, closed shell, and so on. All right, so uh, summary, uh, enabling exascale computing and quantum chemistry uh, benefits from fragmentation, multi-level parallelism, accelerators, in our case, GPUs, uh, novel algorithms, and what we're doing now uh, and will be ready in the near future is uh, RIMP2 on GPUs, uh, RI couple cluster theory on CPU and GPU. The, uh, the CPU is in progress now, the GPU will come next. Uh, analytic gradients for the RI couple cluster methods. And, and in, we, have a, we have a whole new way of doing fragmentation that I don't have time to talk about, uh, but that, could, that probably would be a significant improvement. Um, this is my group. It's, it's, uh, Daniel showed a, a picture like this as well. It's a, it's a group picture for 2020 where you can't have everybody together. So everybody is sitting in their own computer. And I just want to mention that uh, the people involved in what I talked to you about are David Poole, Jorge uh, Vallejo, um, Melissa Alcan, Peng Zhu, Tosapur and Sadathachana, um, uh, Vu and Bu. I have two, two guys from Vietnam. One's name is Vu, V-U, and the other's name is Bu, B-U-U. -U. Uh, so that can be confusing. And um, uh, Taylor and Bryce and uh, Depayan. And I also want to give a, a shout out to Yulim Kim and Sinead Kim. Yulim and Sinead are both from South Korea and they're both giving talks in the last day. So please go to their talks as well. Um, the work was afforded primarily by the, by the Department of Energy, but also NSF and Air Force. And, uh, these are pictures of Frontier uh, and Aurora, which do not exist yet, but they're pictures of what they'll look like when, they're, when they exist. Um, and uh, so I thank all these folks and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Gordon. So we are getting two or three questions. There's already one um, from Dr. Pablo Drahl. So yeah, please go ahead. Dr. Draw. Uh, you compared uh, with, uh, uh, you said that uh, uh, this approach is more accurate than many uh, so, uh, semi empirical methods. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So, I can hear you uh, kind of. Uh, which uh, you said empirical something. methods did you compare to? Can you? Uh, do you know? So, which semi empirical met methods did you compare to? Oh, uh, so um, you're talking about effective fragment potentials, which is frag effective fragment potentials are is that is not a compared to less twenty two. Yeah. Oh yeah, we have we have a uh, two papers in which we compare with S twenty two. Yeah. Okay. 
so they were much better than semiconductor methods. So, yeah, like, uh, because so in general, EFP, um, inter intermolecular interaction energies, so non covalent interaction energies, are comparable to or, or sometimes better than MP2. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, because of the time, so let us just, uh, sorry. So uh, please join me uh, to thank Professor Gordon for the wonderful talk. <laughs>